and welcome. And uh, we're going to give this another try on the Torah Tamima that we worked on yesterday. So let me first of all go ahead and make the bracha. <clears throat> Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshana B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu L'asok B'divrei Torah. Amen. Amen. Here we are. So um, <clears throat> we had done we had done this parallel this parallel statement from Torah Tmima that paralleled what Rashi had said, right? Ve'ele, this is right over here. Tanya, uh, I explained what Tanya meant. It tells you the um, the level of authority, but also the time of this particular statement. Rabbi Ishmael is known as a Tana. He's referred to as a Tana. And Tanaim are rabbis who lived, who are mentioned in the Mishnah and Baraitot that lived prior to the close of the Mishnah. The Mishnah was edited in the year 200 by Rabbi Yehud HaNasi. Uh, rabbis that lived after that period uh, and for a period during, until the close of the Talmud are known as Amoraim, Amoraim. Uh, there is a practical significance to these particular uh, terms regarding the development of halacha, because an amora, an amora cannot contradict what a tana's rulings. They, you, it doesn't. The the sort of way in which to look at it is the closer to Mount Sinai you are, which is the origin of the Torah, the more authoritative your statements would be. So there are various divisions in the process of halacha, uh, and I'm not going to go into that now because I really did want to get into this uh, into this particular Torah Tmima. Anyway, Rabbi Ishmael Omer, Rabbi Ishmael says, ve'ela, this word ve'ela, that's at the beginning of our parsha, mosif al harishonim. It it comes to add to what was said before. It it is not a cut off. Now, we Rashi told us that I believe he said if it just says Ela and not the Ela, then Ela represents a whole new subject. But this is a continuation of our subject. And Ma El Yonim Mi Sinai, and what it's coming to tell us is that just as the material above came from Mount Sinai, Af Hatachtonim Mi Sinai. So what follows is from Sinai. And we'll get back into this. Just going to check a quick something quickly. All right. Um, is everybody able to hear me? Or are yeah, I don't hear any pans or or anything being stacked. I just hear you, so I don't understand what what anybody's hearing. Okay, Judith, are you still having problems? Okay. And okay. I don't see Judith on here. Yeah. Oh, okay. I see. I have to enlarge it. More people have come. Okay. But yeah, no. No, start, start <laughs> over again. Leave and then come back on, Judith, if you can hear me. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to go into the Torah Mima itself right now. Ritsono Lomar. The, the point that he's trying to make is disfarale that... Uh, All right. Uh, he he holds the ma emar besof parshat yitro that what was said at at the end of the previous parsha of yitro and that here's the here's the quote umoshe nigash el haarafel and Moses entered into the thick cloud vayomer Hashem el Moshe and Hashem said to Moses koto mar el bnei Yisrael Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, etc. Nimshecha amirazo, this statement, ad laachar pashat mishpatim, it continues, it applies. In other words, Moses was to tell the Israelites everything that was included in parashat mishpatim with that, uh, that introductory statement. In other words, it's all that, that God was telling Moses to tell the Israelites. Dichtiv sham, 
all right? Because there, in other words, at, end, at the end of Parshat Mishpatim with the laws, it says, Ve'el Moshe Amar, and to Moses he said, Ale El Hashem, go up to Hashem. Uve'yichud, Tzarich Rabbi Yishmael. And what it's saying is Rabbi Yishmael, especially, he, he alone, you might say, requires Tzarich Lidrasha Zo, this particular interpretation, the Shitato, according to the position he takes, Bizvachim, in another sect, in the Talmud, in a tractate in the Talmud, Zavachim, page 115b. De kol mitzvot ha-Torah, and this is where it starts to get sort of interesting, right? That all the mitzvahs, the commandments of the Torah, ne'emaru b'Sinai, were said at Sinai. The all, so two points here. One is all the mitzvahs were given at Sinai, at Mount Sinai. But the second point is rak bichlalan, only in a general statement. In other words, the details of the mitzvahs weren't all given at Mount Sinai. Now listen to that carefully, right? He says, not that all the mitzvahs were given at Mount Sinai. However, not all the details of the mitzvahs were given at Mount Sinai. Ashma'ina kan. So we learn here the parsha zo that this particular parsha of Mishpatim was was uh, was said bifrata besinai was stated. This particular parsha was stated explicitly at Sinai. So if we if we look carefully at what he says, he's simply saying that um, not all the mitz, even though all the mitzvahs may have been given at Mount Sinai. The details of all the mitzvahs weren't given at Mount Sinai. And if I'm understanding uh, this particular, you know, uh, Ber- um, Torah Tamima properly, he's making a point, however, that these particular ones, right, even though not all of them were, some of them were, and these are them. So let's see, right? In other words, unlike the others, that weren't given in their details. The hine and lechora, and it appears here, mashma that would imply the palig Rabbi Ishmael abaraita the Sanhedrin, that Rabbi Ishmael, who is a Tana, disagrees. Right, palig he he debates. He doesn't agree with the baraita of Sanhedrin that's mentioned in Sanhedrin, page fifty six b. Do you want me to pause a moment? Does anybody have, is anyone confused to the point where they need to ask a question, a clarifying question? Or are you able to follow me now? Do I, okay. I realize legally silence implies consent. You're following me? I would love to hear a yes or a no. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so. This is this, so. This is an additional thought that that uh, Torah Tamima brings out, right? That there's someone who disagrees there. She darshu sham that who who that because there in Sanhedrin, there they interpret there the al hadinin nitzavu b'mara, that regarding the dinin, meaning the civil laws, they were actually commanded at Mara and not on Mount Sinai. Or, okay, well, let me stop at that and just say that. Well, I uh, do have a question now about the civil laws. Okay. To me, that phrase, civil laws, seems to imply that these aren't mitzvot, that they're not religious, it just has to do with the laws of the area. But I guess you're referring to mitzvot that have to do with the, with the governance or the society of i don't know exactly yes, what you mean I, by civil laws right it, okay thank you that's a that, that's important so we are distinguishing the uh, between mitzvot that we might call religious laws maybe uh so we in hebrew we talk about we divide laws as ben adam lechavero 
meaning, and that's what we mean by civil laws, meaning between a person and his neighbor, right? Amongst human beings, how they treat, how we treat one another, and ben adam la makom, and between a person and heaven and God. So we make a distinction between those two categories of laws. Does that, I think that's clear, that clarifies it. Yeah, that I wasn't was sure if that's what meant, that, but I get it. Then that's all meets what, right? So, I mean, issues of murder, theft, uh, loans, borrowing, interest, all those sorts of things have to do with dinim. Would that, does that make sense now? It does, yes, thank you. Yeah, laws of kashrut would not come under that particular category then, right? Okay. Right. Aval be'emet, but indeed, so we just had that, that Rabbi Ishmael disagrees with the opinion, right now it's an anonymous opinion as far as we know, that says that these particular dinim, which are what I mentioned in Mishpatim, Mishpatim is primarily about dinim, as you will see. Those were commanded at Mara as opposed to Mount Sinai, right? That's where we're at right now. Aval be'emet yesh One more question. Sure. Mara was... Um the commandments at Mara happened before or after Mount Sinai? Good, good question. Uh, Mara is an incident that we read, read about uh, prior to Yitro, where, where the waters were bitter and he was able to make the waters. And it says, Sham Sam Lochok, that would be the origin of that drasha that says, because those Chukim Umishpat, whatever, they, they appear to be laws given there at Mara. Right, the Torah doesn't specify laws per se. It just says that he sweetened the waters, that they came and they grumbled because the waters were, and the full uh, simple answer to your question is, came before Sinai. Okay? Aval be'emet, but truthfully, yesh lomar, one can hold. So he's saying, it appears on the surface that Rabbi Yishmael is disagreeing with that particular position. And he's saying here that truthfully you could say, that he holds, that Rabbi Yishmael holds. So this is, this is what's great. He says, yeah, they were given at Mara. However, there they were given regarding their generalities. That they needed to adjudicate between a person, between people, a man and his fellow. I, I do not think we brought this out yesterday. So in other words, Rabbi Yishmael doesn't disagree. He says that the, yes, they were certainly given at Mara, but there they were given in generalities. The Khan, but here up on Mount Sinai, the Erbe Pratiot, they were explained in detail, called Din, each and every uh, law. Kamavu'ab Pasha, as is explained in this parasha. The yoter nira, and 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 moreover, it appears she yoter me asher meforash beze nistavu besinai, and not only that, even more than what was explicitly stated at Sinai. Let me see. Let me make sure. Oh, sorry, I got to read this differently. Right, it appears. It, it, it even moreover, it appears that more than, more than is stated in this parsha, in this parsha that we're reading, in Mishpatim, Ne'em Mitztavu Sinai was stated at Sinai. So all this stuff was happening up in Sinai, but, but the details of the halachot, there are some details of these halachot that, weren't, that aren't stated here that were stated while Moses was up on Mount Sinai. They're just not stated in this particular parsha. The ra'aya, and the proof of that is, shehare darshu uh, they interpret, the rabbis interpret, regarding the verse, that is coming up, there is a, a verse coming up that talks about the, the slave who doesn't want to be released at the end of seven years, and, and there's a ceremony that takes place, and he then serves him, I believe it says he will be his servant forever, that's what it says there, but the, inter in other words, the statement in the Torah says he will be his servant or his, his slave forever. But the rabbis understand that as le'olamo shel yovel, to that period of the jubilee year. 
In other words, whenever the Jubilee year shows up and it's every 50 years, he goes free. So it may be less than 50 years, but it certainly isn't forever. And that isn't said here. That's only said, the Lord Mizkar Kan Remis. There's no, there's no hint of anything in the parsha that we're going to read, Me'in Yan Yovel, regarding the Jubilee year. It doesn't say that. Ad Parsha Bahar. Until we get to the Parsha of Bahar, which is the second to last Parsha of Leviticus. So how would the rabbi say that's what it meant here in Mishpatim, that it's talking about the Jubilee year when it doesn't say anything about the Jubilee year here in Parshat Mishpatim. So how do you explain that? Elava died. So it appears certain that Kan Nifratu Kol Parteha Mitzvot, that here up on Mount Sinai, all the details of these mitzvahs were explained, these particular mitzvahs, the Nistaru Torah Be Parshiot, um, Parshiot. However, in the course of the exposition of the Torah, some of the stuff that isn't mentioned here is mentioned later on in the Torah. And I'm uncomfortable with the explanation that I just gave you. I just hope you are. Again, I'm going to pause a second if anyone yes. has anything to say. All right. <clears throat> so here... <laughs> <laughs> kind of plunge into another one, right? This this kind of material is, um, it's just grist for the mill. And this is the stuff of which halakha spends so much time analyzing that the, 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 the development of halakha essentially involves itself in, in uh, going into detail regarding to this kind of material in the Torah, the legal material in the Torah. And then, of course, above and over and above that is the uh, Torah Shabbat Peh, the oral Torah that is not explicitly written in the Torah. So I am thinking to myself that perhaps instead of going into this, the next Torah Tamima, which I have prepared at this particular point, let me go into another Rashi. All right, so we're going to go to the next, next word. And this is going to, I am going to ask you to hold on because some of this stuff is going to be hard to swallow, okay? That the laws are going to be tough and they don't sit with our own present sensibilities. But please hold tight before you feel like you need to judge what's being said in the Torah. And you'll see. Because it's going to deal with slavery. And the Torah clearly does not explicitly forbid slavery. It, um, um, it, the way it handles it is by placing legal obligations with regards to servitude. So here goes. Ki tikne, if you purchase. Evid Ivri, a Hebrew slave. If you purchase a Hebrew slave, Sheshanim Yavod, he shall serve for six years. By the way, the fact that it says key means it isn't commanding you to purchase Hebrew slaves. It is saying in the circumstance, should you purchase a Hebrew slave, right? So that's important to note. It is not a commandment to purchase slaves. So he shall work for six years, and in the seventh year, he should go out free for nothing, it means, okay? Literally, Rashi's going to talk about how we understand that. There's just one word here. I have to scroll all the way back for pretty much one word. I. Certain. There we go. Ki tikne. There's the word in the Rashi, citing the verse. Right. Here we go. Evidivri. Should you purchase a Hebrew slave? And now you're going to look at how carefully we want to understand, because this is legal material, and you know that in it. I would say universally, 
When it comes to legal language, you want to be very careful that there's complete understanding of what's being said. So he says, there are a couple of possibilities. Evid Shahu Ivri. So when it says a Hebrew slave, one possibility is a slave who is a Hebrew or a Noella. But maybe it could mean Avdo Shel Ivri. That is to say, a, a servant who, is, who formerly belonged to a Hebrew, an Israelite. In other words, a Canaanite slave. Here we go. Eved Kna'ani, in other words, he's spelling this out. In other words, a Canaanite slave, Shalakarto mi Yisrael, whom he acquired from an Israelite. Va'alavu Omer, and that the, the Torah is coming to tell us, there's all this in this realm of possibility, Sher Shanim Yavod, and he should work for six years, this Canaanite slave. That, that was purchased from an Israelite. Uma ani mekayem. Okay, so what, what about this other verse that's coming up? How do I, how, how can I support then what it says in Vayikra Kafe in Leviticus 25? Because it says, Vihitnachaltem otam. It says regarding explicitly Canaanite slaves, it says there that you shall, you shall. Be, you shall have them be inherited by your children. In other words, if you own a Canaanite slave, you can then transfer it off to your, you can give it as an inheritance to your children, which certainly implies not six years. So the way you explain that is, if you bought the slave from a non-Jew, it's those Canaanite slaves that this verse is referring to. Remember, this is all by way of debate and supposition. Aval belakuach mi Yisrael, but in the case of a, a Canaanite slave bought from an Israelite, Yetzei Beishesh, he can go out, he has to go out after six years. Talmud Lomar, we have a verse that gets rid of that particular supposition. And that's in Deuteronomy, it says there, Ki yim kor lecha ivri. There it uses different terminology. And it says, in a case where your brother, an Israelite, is sold to you. So in that case, it's very clear. And there it's also talking about going out after six years, etc. Lo amarti ela ba'achicha. I the fact that it's talking about there very specifically about a slave who is an Israelite, okay, who gets sold into servitude, lo amarti ela ba'achicha. I am only talking about a fellow Israelite, a fellow. Okay. We're going to go on. This is very interesting, okay. Ki tikne, if you acquire, if you purchase, who are you purchasing it from? Miyad betin. This law is only applying to a bet din, that is a case where a court, a bet din, shemachruhu began, began vato, who sold him because he stole something. And, I, and we'll go on, it'll explain. So in other words, this person was judged guilty of theft. Kaboshinemar, as is stated in Shemot Kaf Bet, so this is Shemot Kaf Aleph, so in Exodus chapter 22, it says, Im ein law, if he cannot make restitution for the theft that he's guilty of, venim kar began vato, or begane vato, he shall be sold to cover the amount he stole. So, that, so again, there's a challenge to this. Or a Noella. But wait a second. Maybe it doesn't refer to that. You just said explicitly the Torah is talking here about an Israelite slave who was sold by a court to pay for his theft. But maybe it's talking about a Noella, Bemocher, someone who sells. That's more. He sells himself, Mipne Dochako, because of his circumstances. In other words, he's become so poor, he cannot support himself. So he sells himself 
into slavery so that he can be supported. Aval machruhu beitin, okay, but in the case of one of a, one who was sold by a beitin, in other words, the, a whole different circumstance, lo yetse beishesh, he shouldn't go out in six years. In other words, it's suggesting, well, maybe the Torah here actually is talking about a circumstance of someone who sold himself because he couldn't afford to live, not because he had to pay for his crime. And in fact, the Torah excludes such a person. Keshehu Omer, again, we have a deciding factor. Vayikra Kafhe in Leviticus chapter 25, and if your brother becomes poor, your brother with you becomes poor, destitute, and is sold to you. In other words, he sells himself to you. Here we're talking, in fact, the circumstance of someone who sold himself because of his circumstances. Amor, that's what's referring in that particular law. So the, the law that deals with how you treat a, someone who sells himself because of his circumstance, that's dwelt within the Leviticus 25. So then what are we talking about here? When it says, when you purchase. That's talking about someone who is sold by a court. So Rashi is, is giving us a proof as to what the specific, what the Torah is specifically talking about here. And this is certainly one of those cases where if it were not for Rashi, we would not understand it. We would not hold this particular way. I will tell you that again, we're only giving you the generalities. The, um, in, in, um, uh, I'm trying to think of a tractate that deals with it, um, um, but there is a tractate that deals with sal sal with slave slavery, and specifically someone who was sold by a bedin, and it the the fact is that it isn't every circumstance of someone who cannot pay for their for their theft. Um, it has to match the exact amount of the theft. We would have to go into the Talmud there for those particular things, it's possible that that uh, Torah Tamima is going to help us with these particular additional details. So it says, Lechofshi, he should be sold. Lechofshi, Lechairut, Lechairut means um, freedom. Lechofshi chinam. So why is it saying for nothing? Meaning he does, there are circumstances where someone could pay to have themselves released from their servitude. It's complicated. The laws regarding that are a little bit complicated because what a slave owns, his master owns. So the question is, how could a slave actually have any money to pay his owner to release him? Um, so prior to the six years or whatever, right? Because that's what we're talking about here. Uh, he, he could have a friend who could pay the owner uh, the the amount owed for the remainder of his term. So chinam means he doesn't owe him anything. The slave doesn't owe him anything. He has to be set free. No charges involved. And it's probably a good place for us to stop today. And I did want to give you a chance to, to see this Rashi when it comes into legal the legal kinds of texts. So I would love some reactions if you have any reactions. Well, uh, it makes it, it clarifies how some people would use um, this in order to justify slavery, how people would use their Bible to say, see, it says in the Bible, I'm not talking about just Jews. I'm talking about how slavery has been and justification for slavery. So I can see that without the, um, the depth of knowledge that you need to discern what the heck they're talking about, you can use this in other ways to justify slavery. 
But it's also interesting how um, you're right about that, that people on both sides of the issue use the Bible to justify it. But the people who justified slavery through the Bible did not follow the laws of slavery that are outlined in the Bible. They just had an anything goes, you know, or any of the other biblical laws. They just kind of had an anything goes kind of attitude. It's like, you, so you can see the fallacy of their use of justifying it for, for slavery when they didn't, you know, really care about any of the humane laws that, you know, went along with, with right. slavery or anything else, you know, well, in terms of treating people. That's why stupid people should not be in power. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> okay, let me, okay, it's, it's almost, it is time, right? It's, it's, eight, it's eight o'clock here and I, I probably need to stop. This, it still raises issues. We, if, when we go to the next verse, that is gonna raise eyebrows because I will tell you that understanding the nature of slavery is you are owned. It's not your work that is owned by the person who hires you or your time that is owned by the person who hires you. It's that you yourself are owned as property. You become someone's property. And the Torah supports that notion, which of course raises questions given our present sensitivity. Although from what I have learned about types of imprisonment that go on to this very day, and I know there's slavery today for people who, in fact, wind up in debt and can never pay. There's terrible kinds of things that are going on today. Having said that, having said that, I thought this may sound like a rationalization, and please forgive me, but I wonder to myself if, because the Torah isn't saying, well, are there places where the Torah says, they're people who should be your slaves. It's not clear, but at least my sense is that the Torah is trying to work in a culture that if you put the Torah in context, Gold, it's what you were saying yesterday. If you try to put this in context and where slavery is absolutely part of a culture where it's an accepted, accepted behavior. And if the Torah is trying to wean people away from slavery, this might be a way in which it's done. In but which the two things kind of contradict what you just said. One is this passage that you have to let people go for free, which is not complete ownership. And the second is that according to Judaism, really you don't own even your own life, only God owns everything. So there's a, there's a you know, it's a little more nuanced, I think biblically than it is um, in other, you know, philosophies of enslavement. Right. The distinction, Lauren, to answer at least one of your questions is that the Torah makes a distinction between Canaanite slaves and what they term as Canaanite slaves, as opposed to uh, Israelite slaves. And essentially, an Israelite can never be a slave in the sense of a person being owned, right, where the person is owned uh, by another Israelite. That cannot, according to Jewish law, that is out of the question. However, the Torah, as we suggested by this one verse that said, you can, I'm using inherit as a transitive verb now, right? That you can, you can leave these to, you can leave these Canaanite slaves to your children. And bequeath, that, yeah. Yeah, bequeath, thank you. That is where, you know, it's, it's suggesting that it's possible. Now, I have to stop because it's already 8.04. Let's hope we can discuss this a little further later on. Okay, thanks. Bye, Shira Beth. Bye, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording.